several years now, and the difference here today will be that there are most of presentations by different students from different universities, and all of this is going to be in English, so it's an opportunity for them to practice their English. Okay? Um, the other thing I wanted to point out is that I mentioned how, and this was actually a question I was just asked about in the interview about uh, you know, the evolution of sentence. So the thing I pointed out here is that the success of the first sentence for chronic diseases is not something that was generated in 10 years. The center of the system at the nine years has been incredibly uh, successful because there was a move to this center, there was another center that was financed for 10 years before, and there was a transition funding in the form of a ring grant, which permitted the transition to a new uh, funding company. And so essentially the success story is the result of continuing work for 20 years in not only developing scientific know-how, but also administrative know-how, and also basically uh, acquiring equipment and technology allows you to be successful at that level. So this is just a reminder for, I think it's important also when thinking about regional development, it's something that's going to take some time. You can't do it with projects for three, five years and so on. And there has to be a plan in mind long term that goes beyond and extends beyond perhaps one funding period, maybe includes two or three funding periods. And that also requires sensitizing the most respective institutions to the need for the form of that kind of forward thinking. <coughs> okay, after that little intro, let's do uh, talk about science. So, um, this is the uh, subject today. And what I'm going to talk about is how to develop a sort of lab, um, focusing on a very specific molecule and some kind of because we work on Kavirin. But I think it's important as a researcher to have an objective, a, a focus, because it's very easy to get sort of lost in all the different possibilities that developing scientific, uh, uh, scientific projects can involve. Um, so a, somehow a streamlined approach to science can be also beneficial to uh, uh, being successful later on. That's sort of the message I want to get across. development of cancer. Okay, so this is our history. We started up the lab called the Laboratory of Cellular Communication um, in uh, 1999. We got to Santiago and um, we formed this laboratory, um, which is actually two laboratories in one, as you can see here, so a fairly large group of people. Um, <coughs> on the one hand, we have the group of Lisette Leighton who works on astrocyte neuron interaction and you'll hear in her presentation tomorrow about how this interaction then can also be corrupted to some extent when astrocytes become reactive, so as a consequence of inflammation. Uh, and so what I'll be talking about uh, is the other side of the medal here, which are cancer cells and how cancer develops. Um, so, um, you know, if anybody wants to know more about our lab, here's the website, um, and then all the details are there and all the publications are there. Okay, so just a reminder here, cancer is the leading cause of disease-related deaths in Chile since about 2020, um, uh, basically uh, uh, being more prevalent now than cardiovascular diseases, or deaths due to cardiovascular diseases. Cancer, there's one name, but it's many diseases, and that's a big problem. So we have, of course, cancers that essentially differ to the tissues or organs. <coughs> cancers are predominantly uh, dis a, a disease or a malfunction of uh, epithelia. Something goes wrong with the epithelia, and of course all these organs have epithelia. Um, this is a ranking based on deaths in the population, not prevalence. And uh, gastric cancer still is the leading cause of death in the Chilean population, at least in males, 
followed by other cancers that down here. Um, <coughs> colon cancer is rapidly becoming number one in the country. It's growing incredibly rapidly, the incidence, and of course, as a consequence of the incidence, also death rates due to this cancer will probably increase and later will become the leading cause of death. This mainly due to changes in dietary habits and uh, other circumstances. Okay, so cancers, uh, breast cancer is very prevalent, obviously, in women. And what I'll tell you about the mechanisms I'll describe are important in these cancers here. So gastric cancer, breast cancer, um, also it's not in, uh, in the circle here, but it's I think important in gallbladder cancer, colon cancer, and melanoma. So it's a mechanism, or the mechanism I describe are valid in different kind of cancers. So I think that's the important message. Okay, what we work on, and what, we've, what I've talked about here on a number of occasions are these different projects. So there are four big areas uh, we work on in the lab. So on previous, previous things I've talked about, for instance, our work on Helicobacter pylori and how it contributes to the development of gast development of uh, gastric cancer. Um, also, we have uh, sort of been in, become involved in projects related to the microbiome, uh, ba basically the interaction between different microbiomes, uh, microbes, and how individual microbes can modulate the virulence of another microbe. So specifically, for instance, the interaction between Helicobacter pylori and Porphyromonas gingivalis, which is a project we developed with uh, Dennis Brown, and I talked about that last year. Um, exosomes is also something we're very interested in. Uh, for reasons of time, I won't be able to say much about it. We'll I, ma I will mention some project. And uh, the uh, important thing for today's talk is this schematic here, which we'll learn more about uh, in the presentation. Okay, and the focus here is on this protein, Kavila 1, which is a structural protein. Um, as you can see here, it can oligomerize. It associates with uh, lipid structures in the membrane called lipid rafts that are rich in sphingolipids and cholesterol um, and it then sort of aggregates and forms then a coat and you can see these structures in the electron micro, uh, microscope as cavilli, so indentations of the plasma membrane. So it has a structural role. It has an important role in uh, cholesterol transport to it, but we're not really interested in that. Um, we're more interested in its role as a signaling molecule. And I'm particularly interested in this talk, this amino acid residue here, which is tyrosine 14, which is phosphorylated and responsible for many of the changes I'll talk about. Okay, so this is, as you can see, in a fiberglass formation of these structures, um, uh, Kavile, and if you have a, a mess, for instance, from uh, knockout animals, then you won't have Kavile. So it's dependent on the presence of Kavile. Um, as I said, we're more interested in the role in signal transduction, and in it initially it was reported to be an inhibitor of, let's say, s all sorts of signaling events that favor tumor development. Um, some of the molecular targets being those indicated here, and that was about the thinking around 2000 uh, and a bit more. Um, so that's the scenario when we got into the field. And our initial finding that we report in cancer research is shown here. Um, how you can see these uh, colon adenocarcinoma cells with, that do not express cavile and they form tumors in used mice. And if you introduce, uh, ectopically of course, overexpress uh, cavile, there is no tumor formation. So by definition, it's a tumor suppressor. Okay, no one would argue with that. And the question was, okay, how does it do it? Um, and of course you would say, well, you have already all these mechanisms that were known, but it turns out that we came up with a different mechanism. Okay, when, <coughs> before I move on, when we wrote up this paper, published this paper in 2000, it was obviously about the role of Kavielin uh, uh, as a tumor suppressor, but there was one thing uh, I noticed and also wrote that the discussion, which is summarized here. So what we noticed is that, that um, essentially Kavielin appears to be initially down-regulated, 
which is a process that is associated with primary tumor formation. So uh, it's a tumor suppressor, so you need to suppress the tumor suppressor to promote tumor development and transformation. That made sense. Then regulation occurs by a methylation, so epigenetic process. But what we also saw in looking at the literature is that there were many instances where apparently later on cavulin was upregulated. Um, for instance, in drug resistant cancer cells, colon cancer cells, or breast cancer cells, and so on. So we surmised that uh, perhaps re expression of cavulin at later stages would be then be related to enhanced malignancy and, for instance, metastasis. And that actually turned out to be, to be the case. And we spent about 20 years trying now to understand how it acts as a tumor suppressor and how it transits, transits to becoming a promoter of metastasis. And if this is sort of uh, in a, a graphical display of our thinking, um, uh, the model we developed and proved over time. So Kavila is present in the normal epithelium, actually in a lot of cells. Uh, when they are tr become transformed, the expression is lost. This is cases is that Kavilin expression goes up in later stages. And when that happens, the Kavilin is, is bad. So it's a, bad, uh, a, a marker of poor prognosis in the patient, um, and it's associated with enhanced metastatic potential in these cells. Um, and so, okay, so what is this, what is the protein doing? How, how can it do this and then do that? Sort of the opposite. Um, so we really only focused on the role of the tumor suppressor. And the first finding we came up with, this was based on microarray results and uh, a lot of different approaches, uh, was that providing a protein that is generally upregulated in tumors and human cancers, it, it was therefore a market for prognosis, um, is suppressed, the expression was suppressed by the presence of cavulin in cells, cancer cells. Uh, and we then show that this is because it is able to prevent deeper TCF less dependent transcription in survival and many other genes. So of course this explained how Kavielin could prevent uh, or reduce cell survival, prevent proliferation. And note here the first author in this paper was uh, Vicente Perez, who is here with us today, only because we asked us about his own research for that one. He was a PhD in the lab, he went on, did a postdoc, and is now an independent researcher with his own line of research. Okay, so that's uh, all nice and good. Um, I'll show you this scheme here. This is a, is a summary of how beta catenin presence in the cytosol is regulated. So there is a destruction complex here, um, which you'll hear a bit about in the poster by Daniela and Eva. Um, uh, which contributes to the destruction of the protein, and there is a complex here at the cell surface uh, where beta here is present that sequesters beta catenin. So you have regulation by either sequestration or degradation. If one of those mechanisms fails, then you accumulate beta catenin in the cytosol, go to the immune system. Okay. And the key finding was this one here, showing that the ability to of Kavilin to prevent beta catenin and TCF less dependent transcription of survival was dependent on the presence of E coherent. So this is the what I call the E coherent connection to Kavilin me mediated tumor suppression. Again, Vicente was the key in um, showing um, uh, basically uh, obtaining these results. So the tumor suppressor function of Kavilin apparently, at least the mechanism we described, depends on the presence of ecoherent. Okay, these are the papers. Uh, uh, first one, Jordan Cross Science. Um, then ecoherent is required for this to uh, for this ability to prevent beta catenin and TCF less dependent transcription, particularly of survival. We then went on to show that it also regulates this mechanism controls other genes. For instance, oxygenase 2, and that will become important in my second part of the talk, but cyclooxygenase 2 is a protein that uh, produces prostaglandin E, prostaglandin E2, which is a pro-inflammatory molecule. So, uh, this is the scheme here, so beta catenin can also promote B uh, TCF less dependent transcription of COX2, and by suppressing that, you reduce prostaglandin E2, levels uh, in the environment. Okay, 
And the other thing we came up with in these studies is we discovered a new role for surviving, and that is that surviving in a sort of a food backwards, essentially, amplification loop can promote uh, the expression of VGF and or for tumor angiogenesis. So the, um, this is this model here. So essentially, if surviving is able to activate a signaling mechanism in the cell in CR3 codependence that promotes stabilization of beta catenin and beta catenin transcriptation. So the nucleus of beta catenin, uh, TCF dependent transcription there is VGF. And VGF you require, as I pointed out, for angiogenesis. Okay. So we can conclude so far that the Kirill and Nicotian complex suppresses, uh, suppresses surviving and cyclooxygenase 2 expression. This complex is therefore it's anti-inflammatory and also anti-angiogenic, and obviously that is uh, a, a pretty good uh, uh, mechanistic explanation of how it's acting as a tumor suppressor. Okay. So this was all, or this, these were studies we did in cells, cancer cells, different kind of cancer cells. So this, this translates to uh, an in vivo situation. So what we did there is use these B16F10 melanoma cells, and uh, these obviously form subcutaneous tumors here, and you can look at tumor growth uh, as a function of presence or absence of covelin, presence or absence of ecodelin, presence or absence of the two. Um, and so the mock cells, which do not express covelin, obviously uh, the tumors grow rapidly, and when you introduce covelin here, you get tumor suppression. So what we can see here, which is coincident with what we were seeing in the colon adenocarcinoma model we had developed in th at the time in Switzerland uh, using nude mice. We didn't have access to nude mice here in Chile. So we did it with these cells. Um, and what you can see is this tumor suppressor effect is as efficient as e -cadherin on its own. e is a classic tumor suppressor. But what is very startling is what you see here. When you combine the two proteins, there is no tumor growth. So each one individually can reduce tumor growth, cannot prevent it, but the two together completely block tumor growth. And you can inject these cells and look at the animals, and they survive over 100 days, no problem. Normally, they would die after 20, 30 days. OK. So this is a very, very powerful tumor suppressor complex. Uh, and not only that, in this, uh, using the same cells, you can um, develop a metastasis assay. So if you inject these cells into the tail vein of the mice, um, these cells specifically metastasize to the lung. They were selected for that. Um, and then you can quantify metastasis formation in the lung. And what you can see is these are the mock cells, and these are the E- uh, the covelin expressing cells. And of course, um, what we see here is the covelin on its own now can promote metastasis. It's about a threefold increase here. Uh, e cadherin is, of course, a tumor suppressor. Um, and, and so it also prevents metastasis. And when we combine these two together, there is absolutely no metastasis to the lung. So again, a very efficient, very powerful complex uh, in preventing now covelin enhanced metastasis. Okay. So this led to this publication. So we could hear and determines covelin one tumor suppression or metastasis enhancing function in melanoma cells. In the course of these studies, one of the questions came up, and this was a, something that pe people always commented on, and that was injecting cells into the tail vein of a mouse is not necessarily a real proxy for a metastasis, because mass metastasis develops spontaneously, one way or another. There are many mechanisms. OK, so we developed a mo uh, model to address that issue. And this is this paper here, which I'll mention again at the end of my talk. So what we did here is inject cells, let them develop a tumor, and then we had a surgeon operate on the tumor, remove the tumor, and close up the animals. And then we evaluated reincident tumor growth and metastasis to the lung. And the thing is that if you do that, um, you, you have uh, both. Um, and you can show that essentially 
the cavealin promotes, again in these cells, spontaneous m metastasis in out of the lung, not this sort of uh, just artificially induced metastasis. Okay, so we can therefore conclude uh, uh, these results we've already seen. So E. and cavealin cooperate in tumor suppression, and importantly, E. cotillion completely abolishes cavealin one enhanced metastasis. Obviously, the question that begs answering is, is why, how? Okay, so let's go back to our little schematic here, which we've published uh, numerously over and over again uh, over the years, and we're focused now, we looked at this part, and we're focused now on the role of metastasis, cavealin in metastasis. Obviously, I can't go into all the details, but just one key experiment here showing that, for instance, in these MDA MB2, uh, 231 cells, which is a highly metastatic breast cancer cell line with high levels of cavealin expression, if you knock down cavealin and then you do a, what is called a spreading assay, initiation and migration assay, you can see that there is a pronounced activation, rather rapid activation, of a small G protein called RAC1. So this protein here it activates, is activated by exchanging GDP for GTP. This does not happen in the absence of cavealin. So if you're not down cavealin in these cells, you don't get RAC activation. So we figured this is probably the mechanism by which cavealin is promoting at least migration and invasion, maybe metastasis. We also related in another cell line. This is a, a human melanoma cell line, but if you increase the expression of cavealin in these cells, you also increase the activation state of RAC1. So this is something that applies to different cell lines. We've also done similar experiments in colon cancer cells. So it's a fairly transversal mechanism. And so this is the model that we came up with, uh, sort of uh, roughly 2014. So cavealin uh, on the right um, is nice. It's acting as a tumor suppressor here, together with e cotinin nicely sequestering beta-catenin, or at least aiding in sequestering beta-catenin, um, uh, precluding thereby beta-catenin TCF left-dependent uh, transcription of these genes here. In doing so, you increase cell death in the cells, you reduce proliferation, and you reduce survival, which is what you want or would expect of a tumor suppressor. In addition, the presence of E-cadherin suppresses metastasis by cavealin 1, and what cavealin 1 does on its own is shown here to the left. It's bad. Um, it uh, uh, leads to the activation of RAC1 and promotes thereby migration, invasion, and metastasis. And this is a process that is dependent on, not shown here, tyrosine phosphorylation on the residue tyrosine 14. Okay, just a little bit of evidence here that shows that all connecting our cavealin to RAC and what we found here, again in collaboration with Vicente, is that RAD5 is involved. So it's another small g protein. So you have cavealin, RAD5, RAC1. And the way we show that is using these experiments, wound healing assays, so migration assays, transmigration assays. If you introduce uh, cavealin, you increase the migration of these cells. So this is a colon cancer cell line, a uh, melanoma cell line. And if you knock down RAD5 in these cells, you lose this increase in migration or transmigration, as you can see here. So um, we did other experiments to show that actually RAD5 is abstract, upstream of RAC1. And so RAD5 is required for metastatic cancer cells for cavealin 1, hence RAC1 activation and migration invasion. Is this relevant to metastasis? Just one experiment here. So if we do the same metastasis assay, this again injecting into the tail vein, um, and looking at lung metastasis. So th this is, these are the metastases you get in the lung. You can quantify it because these cells are pigmented, and so you get pigmented tumors, and then you can actually dissect them out and weigh them. Um, and you then can calculate the percentage of lung mass that is occupied by tumors. And so you see here that when you express cavealin, this metastasis, as you can clearly see here, increases. And if you knock out RAD5 here, um, you essentially abolish this increase. And this is the quantification down here. So clearly, RAD5 is required uh, for this 
process for metastasis. And so we then uh, came up with this schematic here showing Kavila in two states. On the left, the tumor suppressor. On the right, promoter of metastasis. Kavilin here gets phosphorylated by SAP family kinases, uh, and it activates RAP5 and does so by sequestering a protein here called P85, which is a gap for RAP5. So RAP5 is not inhibited, becomes activated. It then activates a GAF here called TM1, which activates uh, RAC1, which then promotes migration invasion and metastasis. So that's the bad side of Kavielin. On the other side, we have Kavielin in a complex here with E-Cadelin, sequestering beta catenin and it's good there. And the key thing is that in this complex, it's not phosphorylated. And so one of the things we figured out recently is why it's not phosphorylated. And it turns out that in this complex is present a, a tyrosine phosphatase called PTPN14, which specifically dephosphorylates Kavielin in the complex. So when it's in the complex, it can't be phosphorylated. Only when it escapes from the complex can it become phosphorylated. So why would it escape from the complex? Obviously, if there's no e here here, there's no complex. And so the uh, <coughs> question we asked is, is it possible that you can have a complex and somehow dissolve the complex and then see the, the basically pro-metastatic role of Kavielin? And, you know, in short, yes. Um, and the key here is, and this is why I'm telling you this here today, inflammation. So we surmise that possibly, if you have a pro-inflammatory situation, you could generate circumstances in which, although you have this tumor suppressor complex, it would no longer be functional because the inflammation would basically dissolve the complex, and you'd have Kavil and phosphorylation. Um, possibilities there are, of course, many. We heard about cytokines and bacteria and lots of other things. The one thing we've been interested in previously was uh, cyclooxygenase 2, and we'd work with prostaglandin E2, and then we surmised that possibly, since prostaglandin E2 is pro-inflammatory, it might be able to do the same thing, to dissolve this complex. And that is actually the case. So. Here's some real data now, not just sort of titles of papers and, and other things and models. So we have uh, Western blots here showing E. cadherin, Kavielin, expression in cells, these B16F10 cells, have either had Kavielin, E. cadherin, or Kavielin and E. cadherin. Just so you see the expression levels, this is the quantification. And we then did immunoprecipitation experiments down here, pulling down Kavielin and looking at the presence of E. cadherin. And the prediction was, if prostaglandin was going to work, we should have less E. cadherin in the complex with Kavielin. That turns out to be the case. So this is the chimeric precipitation of Kavielin and E. cadherin. And if you treat with prostaglandin E2, you have less E. cadherin in the complex. And well, this is basically the, the uh, quantification here, shown in a bit of a strange way, because it looks like there's an increase. But it says an increase in the Kavielin to E. cadherin ratio because the amount of E. cadherin in the co-immune precipitate decreases. So that's what this is supposed to show. Okay, so does this do anything to tyrosine phosphorylation of kavielin, which is obviously the key question here, and the answer is yes. So these again are uh, MOX cells and kavielin expressing cells, plus or minus prostaglandin E2, uh, and just look at uh, uh, the kavielin expressing cells here and we see a substantial increase in tyrosine phosphorylation here, as we would with a specific antibody, when we treat with prostaglandin E2. So it fits exactly our, our sort of line of thinking. Uh, we did another experiment looking at FAC, and FAC also increases phosphorylation. This is also associated with pro-migratory um, uh, phenomena, so especially then focal adhesion turnover and things like that. Um, but there's no real difference between cells with or without Kavir, and it just generally increases the phosphorylation of FAC and would be favorable for migratory events. And this is the quantification here. Okay, so clearly the complex in the presence of prostaglandin E2 ceases to function as a suppressor of Kavir and phosphorylation, and therefore, uh, as we would expect, um, promotes. Uh, should promote migration, invasion, and then also metastasis. Okay, 
migration data. So this is just looking at a uh, typical transfer migration assay. If you look at the difference between mock cells and chameleon expressing cells, you have a clear increase in the migration of these cells when they express chameleon. Um, if you introduce E to DNA, obviously there is no migration. Um, if you treat the prostaglandin E2, you get a general increase in migration. And particularly interesting or important here is, for the argument I'm making, is the difference between cells expressing chameleon E cadherin, cells expressing chameleon E cadherin, without or with prostaglandin E2. And so there is a very substantial two to three fold increase here, of course, a significant increase. So that is exactly what we predict. If we then look at the invasion data, that's just a different uh, type of assay, looking uh, at matrix gel invasion there of cells. Um, it's essentially the same picture. So Kavirin enhances migration, Kavirin expression. If you have e cadherin, you essentially have no or very low migration. If you treat with prostaglandin E2, you get a generalized increase in migration. And that is also true when you have Kavirin e cadherin expressing cells. Again, about a threefold increase, exactly as we have predicted. Okay, this is in vitro. Does this translate into in vivo? Uh, here now a tumor formation assay, uh, which we have, I've, I've sort of showed you sort of typical data on that before, but it's, it's just we inject cells and look at tumor growth here and you use a caliper to calculate the volume, so tumor volume over time. This is a bit of a messy graph. Um, but the only thing we need to focus on here is the difference between the cells expressing cavilin and E. cadherin here, these blue ones here. This is this line down here. So there is essentially, as I also showed you before, there is no or very little tumor growth. If, however, you treat these cells with prostaglandin E2, which is this one here, the light blue, tumor growth increases. So, clearly, tumor suppressor uh, is not functioning as a tumor suppressor anymore. Um, the question now is, we know that Kavirin has been liberated from this complex, um, so it should promote metastasis. And that is also the case. So this is a metastasis assay. We inject the 200,000 cells into the tail vein and look at the lungs after 21 days. And so when you just look at um, uh, Kavirin expressing cells, of course, metastasis goes up. If you have cadherin, it blocks. If you treat with prostaglandin, in general, metastasis increases. Um, and specifically, it's not as dramatic here. I would have expected more, but there is a significant increase between these cells, cadherin e cadherin, and these cells, cadherin e cadherin, plus prostaglandin e2. So in that sense, it corroborates our hypothesis that cadherin um, is somehow liberated from this complex, gets phosphorylated, promotes migration, invasion, and metastasis of cancer cells. Okay, so these are the conclusions. So uh, basically, prostaglandin E2 is pro-inflammatory. Prostaglandin E2 exposure dissolves the complex. Um, this augments the phosphorylation of cavillin and tyrosine 14, and also fat phosphorylation. Um, and um, if we expose cells to prostaglandin E2, e uh, even if they express this complex, um, this overrides uh, the tumor suppressor ability, uh, so you basically uh, impede tumor growth and you promote metastasis. This is the model. So, Kavirin is in a complex here with E. cadherin, sequestering beta catenin. Um, this is a tumor suppressor complex. When you add prostaglandin E2, somehow, we don't know how, that is something we would need to study in the future, this complex dissolves, we get phosphorylation of cavirin, um, and this promotes migration, invasion, and metastasis. Okay. So, uh, this is our lab, or this was our lab in 2020. Uh, a lot of people. Um, uh, so we generally uh, operate with graduate students, postdocs, and we have had tight connections to former uh, students of the lab, like I mentioned, Vicente Torres, also Denise Bravo, Lorena Lovos, who's actually the person in the study I showed you uh, using prostaglandin E2. Manuel, Manuel Valenzuela has been uh, really important for the studies on Helicobacter pylori. Sergio Vega, I mentioned also in the context of the studies we were doing, looking at beta pancreatic cells and the role of 
uh, real and bold in promoting um, celibate. Uh, upon sleep with uh, saturated fatty acids like parmitate. Um, well, and then we have postdocs and graduate superintendents. So a large group. Um, uh, then, when the pandemic was over, all the students graduated and the postdocs went on to new avenues. Some of them got jobs in the universities, in other universities, and the uh, graduate students moved on to a postdoc. So our lab has sort of downsized since then. Uh, we still have a lot of external collaborations. Uh, fewer postdocs, fewer graduate students. The ones highlighted here in purple are present today. So Lila will show you her work. Many of her member Gonzalez as well. Then Daniela Herrera and Sofia as graduate students. And of course, uh, very grateful to the interactions with these people here. And they will present their data here. Gisette Leighton, Gisette de Dore, Denise. And Lorena actually initially should have presented the prostaglandin E2 data I showed you, but couldn't come, so I presented the data. Okay, to finish off now, uh, something else I want to tell you a little bit about, which I think is important, is this here. So we talked about how one of the major objectives of these centers is not only to generate lots of publications and high impact factor and, and so on and so forth, <coughs> but also to train human resources, advanced human resources. So these are all the people that have gone through the lab over all these years. Many of them worked on some uh, on, on topics related to Kavila, but they also they worked on other topics. In general, the students we've had in the lab came into lab with very different expertise. So they weren't all biochemists or, or pharmacologists or, or whatever. So it was always a mix of uh, interests, also microbiologists, also <coughs> medical students, and so on and so forth. So this created a, an atmosphere, I think, that was very productive in terms of generating papers, which is, of course, relevant because we have to apply for grants. But it's also important to, in terms of generating collaborative interactions, which are fruitful, because everybody contributes with uh, different expertise. Um, and so this is something we're also trying to foster here today, right? Bringing together students from different PhD programs so they talk, and that hopefully at some stage the collaborations not only depend on the PIs, but also the students interact, which would be ideal. The other thing I wanted to point out with this is that so roughly 80 people have gone through the lab in the different categories. Um, uh, and the interesting thing is that many of these have now positions um, in universities throughout the country. So uh, I think that's important too, that we've been able to contribute not only for, for uh, training of advanced human resource, but also then have an impact on the development of uh, uh, different uh, institutions. Um, and so I point this out because I, I came up with this article here, I saw some time ago, actually fairly recently, 2023. It talks about brain drain in academia. Um, so, <coughs> so what's this brain drain? Why, why is there brain drain? Certainly, uh, you know, we have smart people in academia, so why, why would there be a brain drain? is that not a lot of people are going into academia anymore. Not a lot of people are going into the PhD programs anymore. And this is a trend that is being seen as of 2010, documented in this article, is a constant decline in people doing PhDs. And what is even worse, um, there is a constant decline. So this is sort of a, a timeline of the development of a career, undergraduate, graduate, postgraduate, and then uh, eventually maybe one day a tenured faculty position. And so what is happening these days is that of the fewer people that go into graduate school and so on, even less then continue the tenure track uh, position and instead end up, for instance, going into industry. Um, and so, you know, that's uh, something that is okay if you have an industry where they develop R&D. That's not necessarily in the case in Chile. So I think it's important that um, we maintain the students happy in the PhD programs. Um, uh, and so this is a, an important message. And I mean, in Santiago, we've seen the decline. There are less people going into PhD training programs. And so this is why I think it's really important to let you know the, the program we 
is accredited and, uh, and there are a lot of people applying to be in the program and we really have to keep that going. And the thing is not only then to train them, but to keep them enthusiastic. Sorry. So, um, so, so go on <coughs> and get tenure positions out of it. So that is sort of the take home message for the Doctorat in Ciencia de America that we have to uh, not only train students but also keep them happy. So they go on. Okay. Um, oh yeah, I have one more thing. Beyond generating papers and training students, does this is a question where you always get, does basic research actually, is it then good for anything? I mean, is it useful? Well, it depends on how you define useful, of course, but, and one of the things I'm really happy about is, is something that we've developed over the last, let's say, five years or so, um, uh, is this, we've been able to come up with a, a curriculum product or involving curriculum. Uh, this is a, a, a molecule with a large number of beneficial uh, sort of characteristics. The problem is it's incredibly insoluble in water and it's incredibly unstable. So all these studies that are in the literature, of which there are many, they are largely irreproducible because it depends on how the people administered and how much and, and so on and so forth and then nobody can reproduce the results. So we decided we would try to come up with a procedure that permits solubilizing the molecule, not in organic solvents because you can't administer curcumin organic solvent to people. Um, you need something else that is biocompatible. Um, and we did so using uh, these nano emulsions here in collaboration with the nanotechnology group in the center. So this again is how translational research between research groups in the center really can allow them generation not only of, know of, of knowledge, basic science knowledge, but then also technological products as is the case here. So we generated this nano emulsion here. So these are vesicles, obviously, well, mitre, basically. Um, and we generated this paper. And this, in this paper, we showed that if you use this model I described, where you generate a subcutaneous tumor, you operate on the mouse, you seal up the mouse, but before doing so, you apply a single dose of this nano emulsion with curcumin, and then you look at tumor evolution so reincident tumor growth and metastasis to the lung, what you see is the nano emulsion completely or almost completely inhibits reincidence and metastasis. Um, so we publish this in this uh, pretty good journal here. Um, and moreover, uh, we got a lot of press coverage at the time. And then the CEO of a company, a startup company called Machitun, he uh, <coughs> became interested in, in this uh, nano emulsion here and contacted us and said, well, couldn't we you know, come up with a product, develop a product, and maybe put something on the market? And so this we've been doing now, and I'm happy to be able to say that we now have a product on the market, so which is called Nanofix. And you can actually buy this. So you can go into the internet and plug in Nanofix, and you can see there uh, these products that you can buy over the web. And the most important advance uh, in uh, the recent months is that now we're going to, uh, with the help of Amazon, uh, actually uh, commercialize these products also in the US, which of course means a huge increase in the market. Um, so we're very excited about that. Okay, so obviously all of this not only depends on students in the lab, collaborators, uh, closer collaborators, former collab uh, uh, co-workers, but also external collaborators of which there are many. Just like to point out Mariana Cifuente here, um, uh, who you will hear from later on, and of course Rodrigo Moore, with whom we're developing uh, several projects. International collaborators, important of course, for solving technological problems. I mean, we have access to a lot of equipment, but there are technological problems we just don't or cannot solve with the equipment we have. Thinking here about things like proteomics analysis of uh, exosomes, um, Nobody here in the country that can do that. So fortunately, I have a friend in the US who's an expert on uh, shotgun proteomics, and we work together. And he basically sequences everything we send him. So we've done the analysis of exosomes from different cancer cells, and also, for instance, from bacteria, outer membrane vesicles, and gained a lot of very interesting insights thanks to this collaboration. Funding, of course, is essential, so we've had been very lucky to have fund funding there for like 20 years. 
and emergent uh, and EU grant funding, many pharmacy projects, and also international funding, ICGB project, project Drug and Trust projects, and ECRI also projects. So, with that, I'd like to close. Thank you for your attention, and I'll be happy to take questions. Very interesting talk. Uh, I took a, a couple of questions regarding the CG group uh, mm -hmm. effect. First, um, how do you measure the the amount of the enzyme that synthesize CG two? Because you observe an increase in top two expression, which lead to the the, the synthesis of of the substrate for the formation of CG two. Mm -hmm. Have you measured that in, in, in your model? Is what we measure thing? is accumulation of prostaglandin E2 in the medium, and we do that after, I think it's something like eight hours. Uh, so, okay. and of course, it's, it's an ELISA assay. You need to accumulate a certain amount to be able to measure it, yeah. So it's not an amazingly okay. rapid process. It takes a bit of time because it's a transcriptional process. Yes. Right. Okay. And the, the other question is, uh, there are any dose dependent effect of CGE2 that makes you the, the in your model the change of the effect of what we observe in cell culture than in the in vivo model? Yeah, well, so of course what we do in vitro, um, we basically just define an amount of prostaglandin E2 that gave us a result we wanted, right? So, so we did determine initially how much it takes to, to, to get the effect. And from then on, we just worked with that concentration. So we didn't, we didn't uh, titrate them in vivo. So that's just too expensive, and, and, yeah. and you'd never get um, a, a, a bioethics committee to approve that, to titrate the use of prostaglandin E2 in using 50 or 100 mice. So we just used one concentration. Um, and the thing there is, that you have an effect that of course is transitory. So prostaglandin E2 binds to a receptor. It's a lysate. And what we do is we pre-incubate the cell with prostaglandin E2, which is fine because you leave the cells with the prostaglandin E2 and do your migration invasion assays and it works perfectly. When, however, then you inject the cells into an organism like a mouse, your prostaglandin E2 immediately gets diluted, yeah. right? Of course. And since it's a ligand, it starts dissociating from the receptor and then your effect goes away, right? So I think, why now specifically in the metastasis assay, the, the, the increase was more marginal than in the subcutaneous tumor formation assay, I, I can't say. But I think it has something to do with the fact that if you inject the cell in the local environment, they're still there with the prostaglandin E2 around them. And if you inju uh, inject them into the tail vein, they immediately get diluted and the prostaglandin E2. And that's why the effect was more marginal there. And my final question was regarding that is, is something that the prostaglandin E2 is activating, for example, platelets that uh, start to, to secrete prostaglandin E2, uh, activating the, the receptors on the cell tumor or something that interacting with the, the tumor cells and protecting them and leading them to uh, metastasize in the, in, in the model? It's a possibility, but what we show is that if you treat just the cancer cells with prostaglandin E2, so if they have this complex, you treat the cells with the complex with prostaglandin E2, you get the effects in vitro migration, invasion, uh, uh, not metastasis, because that's your vivo assay. But so you don't need platelets to get this effect in the cancer cells, right? So we assume that we don't need it in vivo either, but we haven't tested that. It's a possibility. Yeah, well, um, that's something I mentioned we're working on. It's not actually 
uh, secreted, liberated just from, from the cell surface, the thinking is more that it is uh, liberated as exosomes. So we've actually provided evidence that if in cancer cells with, with uh, expressing cavealin, so the cavealin does all these things I said uh, in what I refer to as cis signaling, cis meaning within the cell. But we also showed there is trans signaling. And the way that occurs is that the cavealin can get out of a cell, not as a soluble molecule, but in exosomes. And these exosomes, the cargo, at least the protein cargo, depends on the presence of cavealin. So if you have cells expressing cavealin, the protein cargo of the exosomes will change in, as a function of the presence or absence of cavealin. And we were able to find out, figure out using sp mass spectrometry, what the differences are. And uh, some of the proteins we found are actually cell adhesion molecules. And now we actually have recent results, uh, which hopefully before going on holiday, we'll be able to send off for publication, or at least review, um, showing that one of the components that are specifically accumulate in the exosomes in function of the presence of cavealin is a protein called tenacin C. <laughs> and so you can essentially then do an experiment where you knock out, oops, Um, so, the uh, proteins are loaded to the uh, exosomes in a manner dependent on, so there are several mechanisms that are responsible for uh, uh, allowing proteins to get into exosomes, and one of them is a raft-dependent mechanism uh, involving things like ceramides and single lipids, and so I think cavealin plays a part in, in that mechanism and aids in sequestering proteins and allowing their inclusion. And so the key experiment there was we, and this was a surprise, when we incubated cells that had a huge amount of cavealin already, with these exosomes, we actually got an effect, which I just was not expecting, because I thought the effect of exosomes on recipient cells was because of the cavealin. And if they already had a lot of cavealin, why would they need more cavealin? And so that sort of kept us thinking, and then we came up with this, we found this tenacin, and so what we then did is knocked out the tenacin in cavealin expressing cells. So there you get exosomes which have cavealin, but they don't have tenacin, and they show very similar effects. So it's actually the cargo proteins that are included in the exosomes in function of the presence of cavealin that then determine uh, basic exosome function in trans, quite the cavealin itself. <coughs> Did that answer your question? <laughs> sort of? Right, okay. As well as purity. I mean, we had evidence maybe uh, T, TMF alpha could do the same thing as <laughs> not the only thing. So what is less, the migration and the invasion, or, or what? Migration in, in the mice model. Ah, in the mice. Okay, tumor formation and metastasis. Yes. Okay. No, with EQ deteriorating, you get reduced migration, whatever it is. Uh, and when you have the complex with cavealin, you have reduced metastasis, but when you add the prostaglandin E2, it increases. Yeah. Uh -huh.